Intuitive Methods and Optimization workshop. Um, as uh, was pointed out already in the, earlier in the workshop, uh, one of the themes of the workshop is non-convex optimization, which is an area that's gotten a lot of recent attention. And here we have the expert in this topic, Suvri Sra from MIT, who will tell us uh, a nice overview and a better understanding of this area. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Welcome. I am not, of course, going to be able to do a full overview. So I'm going to do a biased overview. But uh, I just want to mostly keep it at a very high level. I just want to expose people to a bunch of results in the area. So I apologize. There's no theorem proving that I will be doing here. But I, I, my focus is to really expose people to the kinds of results with a bias towards large-scale non-convex optimization. And like any other non-convex talk, the first slide is the obligatory slide, which is uh, just a reminder to ourselves before, that I'm not claiming anything grand in, in here. Simple non-convex problems like that are, as we all know, not so easy. Classical example. So here, of that simple quadratic with trivial constraints, looks very easy. We know that uh, this encodes subset some problem, so it's very hard problem. And then you may say, OK, well, let's uh, forget global optimality. Let's focus on just local optimality. And even there, I'll make this uh, escape in the beginning that, in general, even testing local optimality can be hard. But that's not going to stop us. But just saying that I am not going to make very strong uh, claims. And though we will go towards local optimality towards the end. So that was like my escape code uh, that whatever we talk about non-convex, it's good to remember that even humble looking problems, including testing local optimality, can be NP hard. So yeah. So, thank you, Subert, for bringing this one up, because this has been something that's been a re recurring theme throughout. Even if, you have, even if it was unconstrained, if I replaced x with, with the squares, testing if x is a local minimum. So, but, but then the, I guess it's one point that we always ask for these things where the Hessian is greater than minus epsilon i. That yeah. also tells us nothing, right? We just uh, kind of want to reach that place, but it doesn't really, f yeah. But, but, but being, I guess, uh, the focus here being kind of more uh, machine le uh, learning pragmatism style, I'm willing to do some uh, epsilon approximate uh, things that I accept. But I, I, I really like to bring this example up that even I start you off at, uh, off at a local minimum in a non-convex problem, you won't be able to tell that you are at a local minimum. So it can happen for trivial looking problems, which are not actually so trivial. But that aside, nothing going to stop us, us from talking about large scale stuff. So the talk is going to be mostly focused on optimization. I'm not talking about actually. Uh, of course, I can't cover, cover all the trends. And I'm not going to focus that much on batch methods. By that, I mean full gradient methods. So my bias is more towards stochastic slash incremental gradient approaches for large scale settings. And I think Steve Wright did talk about batch uh, non-convex approaches in his talk a couple of days ago. And I am not going to talk about a super important topic, which is generalization, because the place where this non-convex optimization is extremely hot is in machine learning. And the story of the gap between our knowledge of optimization and our knowledge of generalization, that's a severe gap. But I'm going to focus on just, let's say, the easy part. And I know there's a bunch of people here in the audience, maybe in the room, maybe outside uh, right now at Simons, who have worked quite a bit on non-convex optimization. I, if I'm missing somebody's work, I apologize in advance. I try to be somewhat thorough, but it's a fast-moving area. Uh, I'm, I can't be. If I'm missing something, you know, please let me know. Okay. So with that, let's go on to the kinds of topics. The background is really this motivating problem from the world of deep uh, neural networks. It's an empirical risk minimization problem. You have n training samples. N can be large, millions, billions, whatever. And you're just trying to minimize some non-convex function. And the cost function is encoded by, say, a deep neural network. It could also include things like uh, spectral problems, eigenvector problems, which are 
kind of tractable non-convex problems or mixture modeling or matrix and tensor factorization problems, a variety of such problems. You can kind of look at them in this generic framework. And what I'm uh, uh, going to really focus on principally is that's why just abstracting away what's inside the F. I'm using the machine learning convention of using theta as, or the statistics convention, theta as the variable rather than x, which may be more common in optimization. And that's the problem. And we look at some variants of this empirical risk minimization problem. And just some background history, just quick, super quick, you know, classically, the famous Robbins Monroe paper from 1951 looked at such types of problems, came up with some asymptotic convergence rates. Uh, such a topic has been uh, deeply studied back in the day. So there is uh, ancient work by Norm Shore on space dilation <coughs> methods. There's variable metric SGD methods for that, which uh, Uryasev, uh, he has a whole sequence of works on those. And within, say, adding some convexity and some convergence theory within the world of machine learning, there are things like Adagrad, which are special cases of variable metric methods, but with uh, a different kind of analysis. And popular in the neural network area is this Adam method, which is another such uh, scale gradient method, and so on. And most of these methods, people do have some uh, strong analysis for convex case. And for a long time, for the non-convex case, analyzing these stochastic or these large-scale methods, most of the results that were available were only asymptotic. And it's, I don't think that it's because non-asymptotic results were hard to prove. They were not really that hard to prove. It's just that the community didn't care about them at that time. That's all. And uh, in machine learning, uh, inspired by the attention to iteration complexity coming from convex optimization because it gives a strong statement about computational complexity, the focus now recently shifted into talking about iteration complexity for these setups. So you've, would you, would you, I don't know, actually, I just wanted your impression of this. Would you argue that the reason people like to talk about iteration complexity in machine learning is because they like to use optimization error and generalization error and compare those two numbers? Is that the reason why we have that interest now? That is one reason, because you can make the translation, when doing stochastic optimization, you can make the translation to generalization error. But I think even outside of that, because people say, in theory CS, who started using convex optimization for solving some theory CS problems, they want bound computational complexity. So it's important to talk about global iteration complexity there, too. There's a nice blog post by, I think, Sebastian Ruder on uh, it's a nice, uh, entertaining blog post on he experiments with 20 different gradient-based methods and all these flavors. So if you're interested in the numerics, it's a nice blog to have a look at. Okay, and really the focus is you know going beyond just SGD. By calling it going beyond sounds like something fancy is going to happen. So it's not it's not going to be that fancy, but hopefully a little bit. And. Okay, this is just some prehistory, so I'll actually skip that because I just learned from Mariam that uh, the amount of time I have for the speech here is slightly lesser than the originally declared time. So let's uh, not do too much history, but actually dive into uh, current times. So just to set the stage, there are, uh, for, for most people, a lot of the things will be trivial, but it's just good to set up the stage for, just in case somebody is not fully familiar with the playing field. And after that, it will be sim uh, pretty clear. So simple 1D non-convex optimization problem. You have an inflection point, local minimum, lo global minimum. So getting to a global minimum, as we already saw, is hard. And what we end up doing, of course, in higher D, this actually looks non-convex. This actually is one of the non-convex functions, which I think is globally optimizable by doing other clever stuff, which I'm not going to talk about. But this is just an illustration of uh, things with saddle points. So what we are going to settle with is uh, the, key, the key separation kind of between, say, non-convex and convex when it comes to designing optimization algorithms is, unlike the convex case, we don't have the luxury of necessary and sufficient first order conditions, let's say. So, but at least they're necessary. So we try to say that, OK, at least we have to satisfy necessary conditions. So let's see how quickly 
can your algorithm satisfy necessary conditions of optimality? So that's really the focus initially. And later on, I'll quickly, uh, because I called it trends, make a few remarks about if you want to claim something more about your stationary point, ra rather than just stationarity, you want to try to claim approximate optimality, then you have to look at, or at least it's reasonable to look at, second order conditions for local minimality. We try to approximately satisfy those. But most of the time, I'm just going to summarize some work which is trying to chase this local optimality condition. And just as a reminder, in the convex land, we have the luxury of bounding our distance to the optimal. So we just call it the optimality gap. And we don't really have such a luxury in the non-convex land. So it's kind of common to measure approximate stationarity. So I just call it the stationarity gap. And that kind of suggests to you already, for those of you who do optimization, that this is a differentiable problem. If you had other setups like non-differentiable or other all sorts of problems, you just replace that with a corresponding function that measures stationarity. So for instance, you had a non-smooth problem. And Nestor talks about this in passing in his book and then uh, Gademi and Land study that. Uh, and the reason I'm saying this expectation there is remember, I, I'm going to restress that again and again. We are looking at, uh, Let's use the board once to have used the board once. We are looking at optimizing this particular empirical risk minimization problem. So that's why, and we use a randomized method, so that's why the gap is in expectation. And just for notational convenience, I put a square in there. It annoys some people. So if it annoys you, please bear with me. Some people like to not use the square there. It just makes the algebra slightly easier. And the setup in which we are measuring this progress is a very simple setup. We want to count how many incremental oracle calls do you make, which means, in simpler language, how many individual gradients or maybe function values in addition, if you wish, do you make to satisfy that condition to epsilon accuracy? So that's the playing field. And here is a simple comparison between stochastic gradient descent and versus gradient descent. So stochastic gradient descent runs that iteration. So let's say it's at the one extreme of the spectrum, and gradient descent computes the gradient of the full summation, so I said the other extreme. And we assume the kind of standard thing that the gradients of these things don't fluctuate too wildly, so they're Lipschitz smooth. So for what SGD does is at each iteration, it invokes, it computes one stochastic gradient, or one incremental gradient. And after one by epsilon square iterations, it satisfies that optimality, uh, stationarity condition for you. So the total number of uh, incremental gradients it has to call is one by order one by epsilon square. The O hides Lipschitz constants and diameters and other such stuff, which are usually very hard to compute, so we hide them. And the nice thing is it's independent of n, the number of uh, samples there. I, I mean tr uh, training observations. Interestingly, uh, such a result was uh, formally published only in 2013. And for gradient descent for comparison, and this is like really important. This is super basic, but really important because this comparison underlies the rest of the fancier stuff I'm going to speak. So at one iteration, it computes a full gradient, which amounts to n incremental gradients. So one call of one step of gradient descent has n incremental calls. And we know that it takes O of 1 by epsilon iterations to satisfy the epsilon stationarity. So it's a quick uh, three-line exercise uh, in Nestor's book. And uh, it's, it's actually a three-line exercise. So you take a total of n by epsilon incremental calls. And you can see this depends strongly on n. And the question at this point is, 
that can we find something in the middle? It's kind of an obvious thing once you place them side by side like that. And by the theory of talks, the answer to this question must be yes. So the answer is there are some uh, popular methods in convex optimization, which are uh, methods which are called SAG, SVRG, SAGA, and there's a whole saga of these methods that I could tell you. But uh, the analysis of these methods uh, goes around. It says, hey, we are looking at, rather than the full gradient, we are looking at a stochastic gradient. Stochastic gradient has some variance. It's a stochastic estimator of a gradient. And the amount of that variance governs how fast this thing is going to converge. And if we could reduce that variance, you could potentially converge faster. And that underlying idea was given shape in these papers for the convex case. So Mark is not here. These guys, they started that show in 2012, and then it kind of became very popular. I know that uh, Mert with uh, Asu and Pablo, they looked at deterministic versions also of the incremental methods. And there's, there's a gigantic number of papers on that topic in the convex case. So actually, Francis Bach and I had a tutorial at NIPS on this topic where Francis covered a full length story of the that, that family of methods for convex case, in case you're interested. Anyhow, so these methods, they exist for the convex case, and their analysis of variance reduction, that why they give better <coughs> estimators, relies heavily on convexity. They do, get, they do probably faster than SGD, but uh, the analysis uh, relies a lot on convexity. And we were wondering if you can get around that reliance on convexity and yet benefit from the idea of variance reduction? And the answer is actually yes, they, these methods do work, but uh, requires a slightly different analysis. And one thing that, uh, so uh, my student Shashank at CMU, he worked on this uh, a lot with me over the years. And he told me that when I talk about this, one thing I should mention here is it looks like that the analysis, at least our analysis for the non-convex version of these variance-reduced stochastic methods, it mimics a kind of uh, Nestrov estimate sequence idea, even though this is in the non-convex case. So that's an interesting analysis in case you're interested in looking at that. So the idea works. And let me show you what it uh, does. Quick reminder of what the actual algorithm is. So and I'm just picking one. There's a bunch of such methods out there. This one is very simple to understand and explain, so let me mention that. So what this uh, method SVRG does, it runs, instead of running stochastic gradient, which would be essentially the method, we run it like that. Oh, there's a typo here with S plus 1, sorry. Uh, so instead of running stochastic gradient method with just a stochastic gradient, it runs a double loop. In an outer loop, it computes a full gradient. Sounds nasty. And in an inner loop, it instead of using just a stochastic gradient at one point, it uses information from the full gradient to reduce the variance of the inner stochastic gradient, and then just uses this. And it, so it, and it proceeds in loops. To, so the outer loop goes through s times keep some kind of snapshot around. And then you do the inner loop, which is essentially stochastic gradient, but with a different stochastic gradient, which is biased like this. I mean, shifted like this. It's an unbiased estimator. So it is unbiased because of that. That in expectation will give us stochastic gradient, and this in expectation is 0. See this? This is a snapshot that we kept outside. So actually, I'm just showing it in here for illustration. You just compute this stuff once outside the loop. Try not to implement it by computing it every time inside the loop. So this is computed. That's why once every epoch in the outside. And the whole game is these are the key quantities. How many outer epochs? How many inner stochastic steps? And how, what's the step size? So these three quantities govern the total complexity. And what is the total complexity we are after? The total number of incremental oracle calls. So how many incremental small gradients do we need to compute? So each time you touch the outer loop, that's like n. And 
m steps in the inner loop is little m. So if you carefully trade these off, the total number of incremental calls in, uh, with an amortized analysis can be reduced to do better than batch gradient descent. So what it really does is if you take larger step sizes, then you end up having to run a smaller inner loop. And if you run a smaller inner loop, the method looks more and more like batch gradient descent. Because in some sense, the batch method is using a more accurate gradient. If your gradient is more accurate, you can use larger step sizes, roughly speaking. And if you use smaller step sizes, convergence may slow down, and it translates into doing more work in the inner loop. <coughs> and carefully trading these off, this theory kind of tells how to do these trade-offs optimally, you end up with a good choice of uh, how many inner loops, how many outer loops, what step sizes, to come up with an overall lower complexity. So here is the summary of the results about the complexity. So SGD takes one by epsilon square to get an epsilon stationary point. Gradient descent takes n by epsilon. These SVRG, Saga, etc. they give us a huge, I'm just kidding, saving from n to n to the 2 by 3. And yeah, it means it's, uh, it's some kind of saving, right? You can make n a big number and say that we saved a lot. A lot of work went into that, but a very interesting thing this about to die. A very interesting thing is we don't know if you can improve on that n to the 2 by 3. So we have this result that this is the speed up you get. Some other people who also worked on this, they also got a similar speed up from n to n to the 2 by 3. And it's an open problem to decide, is this the best you can do by doing variance reduction? So. Every time we try to speed stuff up, we hit this n to the 2 by 3 barrier. I don't know why that's happening. I mean, the analysis kind of tells that, OK, you juggle these quantities. You optimize something. This is what comes out. But is this the best possible? I don't know. I would, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to take bets in any direction. So uh, it could be the best possible for the SVRG and Saga style of optimization methods. You could cook up some other version of stochastic method which could be better than this. So I don't know if it, this is a barrier for the whole class of gradient-based optimization methods, or it's just a barrier for this particular double loop style of methods. Anyhow, that's an interesting theoretical question that's still open. So that that's one. So the other thing I wanted to mention to you, which actually Mark uh, is an expert on, the collection of awesome conditions in optimization that allow us to globally optimize non-convex functions. So these are not convex, but they are morally convex. And the class of morals under which things are convex, that's a nice class to study. One of those classes is this uh, famous uh, uh, Voyasiewicz class of functions, which simplify, were, were also similarly, a simpler version was studied by Polyak in 63. These are functions which we call gradient dominated functions. So if you have a function g, this is a, an in any differentiable function, whose distance to its optimal, so this is the global optimal. So that we already assumed a powerful thing about g g's distance to its global optimum or to a global optimum of its in terms of uh, its gradients so if this happens then we are then we can do many things and this condition happens to be actually more general than a bunch of other restricted strong convexity weak strong convexity and what not convexity conditions that arise i think uh, if you are more interested in figuring out more about this class you know ask mark he's sitting back there and he uh, knows this class very well but the cool thing about this class is that, uh, of course, strongly convex functions imply this. One of the things I'm going to mention right now is problems like principal components analysis, like trying to find the largest eigenvector, let's say of a PSD matrix. That problem is a simple non-convex problem, but we know from eigenvalue business that it's globally solvable. That particular problem ends up satisfying a 
polya koyasi with style inequality. Not, it, it's with the double star, so there are some caveats to that. It satisfies it uh, in a non-Euclidean sense, not in a Euclidean space. It satisfies it on a manifold sense, but uh, point is it satisfies that type of inequality, which explains in, indirectly or directly that if I were to now throw a gradient-based method at an eigenvector problem, poof, I would expect fast convergence to global optima. So that's a nice geometric property. So there's a bunch of other variations of this that have been studied, uh, including to non-differentiable functions. Mark has done that with students. And this is a member of a more general class of this Kurdia uh, Vyasevich class of uh, stuff that people have studied in differential geometry, or this also goes under the name of Tsibakov noise model in statistics, et cetera, et cetera. These are basically conditions that people say around an optimum how fast my function grows. And if you have some control on how fast your function grows around an optimum, you can feed that back into to design optimization methods. Anyhow, Bersekas has a uh, new textbook which talks about tens of such growth conditions on functions, that if, if your function satisfy those growth conditions, even sometimes without having access to convexity, you can solve them, uh, optimize them to global optimality. So here is a quick summary. If you had this awesome condition, then even for non-convex functions, we can get results to uh, for stochastic optimization problems to global optimality. So you get actually linear rate of convergence. Now you have log one by epsilon tile stuff. And annoyingly, maybe it's just our analysis, once again, that n to the 2 by 3 uh, stuff comes up. So we couldn't get rid of that. So this is, this is an interesting example, because this is non-convex, and you get global optimality. So uh, th th that's uh, a class that I, I think it's good to be aware of. OK. So here is a toy example. A couple of empirical results I've thrown in. So we just tried to use this uh, non-convex SVRG method to fit a neural network, just very simple neural network, two layers. Uh, so the y-axis talks about training loss. The x-axis is the number of passes through the data. So it's, that's why uh, number of gradients divided by n. n is the sample size, right? So this is the, how many full passes you do. So if you multiply that with n, you'll get this the number of IFO calls. And the various reduced method is a better optimization method than SGD. So the theory suggested that an experiment on a small problem also validates that. And in fact, the theorem was more about uh, stationarity. And you do see uh, that, as suggested by the theory, the method does decrease stationarity gap faster. A weird thing, this is a small neural network, so we also had this luxury, which doesn't uh, always happen, that in fact, even for test error, the faster method did a better job. But uh, I'm not going to talk about test error that much. Because of this, the question is, does this kind of trend continue to hold if I were to try to optimize a deep neural network using these faster methods? And the answer to that is neither yes nor no. As usual, it, it depends. It depends who, on who's implementing it and who's experimenting with it. So it takes a lot of effort to get some answers out there. But generically, yes, if you're not clever about it, it's very easy to screw up with better optimization methods. So Ben knows that very well, that if you are better at optimization, it's pretty easy to screw up performance on deep networks. So, and this one is claiming to be better at optimization. So to make it compete on a deep neural network, you have to work harder. And that's only for the test error. For optimization, of course, it does a better job. So, OK. So, so something worth noting now as I cover more trends, the world of non-smooth, non-convex optimization begins to open some surprises. And in convex land, what happens is because of a very complete subdifferential calculus of non-smooth stuff, many things that you can do with smooth convex optimization, at least uh, in principle, a large number of those algorithms and analysis you can carry over into the non-smooth setting if you manage to encapsulate your non-smoothness nicely. And somehow, in the non-convex land, even if 
the non-smooth part of your minimization problem is a convex function like L1 norm for sparsity or an indicator function to enforce a constraint set, we run into some surprises. And what happens? You look at this type of setting, so non-convex composite objective problem, most harmless looking kind of problem almost. So the differentiable part, so the non-convex part we assume it to be differentiable and the non-differentiable part we assume it to be convex. So the simplest kind of uh, non-smoothness. And if you were to run this vanilla method like proximal stochastic gradient descent. So if things were convex, you could run this. So what proximal stochastic gradient descent is doing is it takes the stochastic iteration and hits it with essentially projection like operator, which handles the non-smooth part. It's like uh, soft thresholding or just orthogonal projection if, you have, if this function is the indicator of a constraint set. You can apply that, and if, if the problem is convex, this also works, you can easily prove it. Prox operators are non-expensive, et cetera, et cetera. So for prox SGD, convergence is not known for non-convex problems. It's kind of unsettling that such a basic method, so this is one of the open pro second open problems, maybe more interesting than my n to the two by three problems, is this obvious method that you would just program out of the box we don't know if it converges, let alone rate. So there is some partial progress by Gadimi, Lan, and Sung, in which uses the following idea that for stochastic case, we don't know it converges, so let's gradually make the method non-stochastic by using ever larger mini batches. So make it less and less stochastic, and then you can prove a convergence. There's a double loop plus projection plus subgradient method by Dummick, Davis, and Grimmer, which actually has a projection and subgradient, and they do have some rates, but the method is uh, more complex than just the vanilla iteration. So understanding whether this works or coming up with a counterexample that it doesn't work would be really good to know. So that's a non-convex surprise. Are there any experiments that suggest that this could work or? So the, like the obvious experiments that you run, it seems to work, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm guessing that uh, one should be able to make it work, but you may need one or two small technical assumptions on variance. And the intuition for that is actually here, that if instead of vanilla stochastic gradient, you were to use stochastic gradients with lesser variance, then we can actually show that the iteration converges again at that crazy n to the two by three by epsilon rate. And now I've seen it in three or four places, that's why I thought that, okay, either that's the limit of our analysis or maybe this is what these methods can do at best. But there is some care needed in there. So it's not like out of the box you can do variance reduction and it works. A weird thing happens if you just apply variance reduction out of the box, you can prove convergence and you can prove convergence at the rate n by epsilon. Oops, stochastic method with the same complexity as a deterministic method, we gain nothing. So you have to be a little more careful to get speed up even with variance reduction. So it could be that without variance reduction, this is much trickier. You have to be a little bit more careful in the way you write the algorithm or in the way you do the analysis? Uh, the way you implement the algorithm. the algorithm. Yeah. And I'll already, okay, because you asked, I'll already give away the answer. Uh, and that's another open problem. If you use a sufficiently large mini batch in addition to reducing the variance, then you can get it. However, here the mini batch has to be just sufficiently large, it doesn't have to grow. So it's, the mini batch has to be of size sublinear in n, but it has a non, it's non-constant. So it depends on n, the number of training data points. And if you can make a method converge by just using a constant size mini batch, uh, I think, because in all my implementations and all our experiments, constant size mini batch seems to work, so I believe it'll work here too, but I don't know. Uh, does the mini batch size depend on epsilon? No. 
So fortunately not, yeah. Okay, so let me maybe, whatever, this is like some experimental results on applying this to non-negative PCA type problem. So the, that's just, let me move ahead to just show you that, okay, this does work better in practice also. I just mentioned it here because it's kind of uh, analyzing stochastic algorithms for large scale PCA problems is a, uh, has been popular in past couple of years in the machine learning community. There's a bunch of people listed here and there's more papers on that topic. But anyhow, let's move ahead. I'll just mention one of my favorite uh, non-convex structures under which uh, you can make interesting uh, <coughs> claims is if you're looking at these empirical risk minimization problems, but the parameters that you're optimizing, rather than come from a Euclidean space, they come from a nonlinear surface like a manifold, the same kind of ideas go through. So I'll give you an advanced moral of the story because I'll have to accelerate, uh, is that this various reduced business, wherever you, have, you use gradient methods, Variance reduced methods, uh, wherever you have previously managed to use gradient methods, whether it is for manifolds or Euclidean optimization, variance reduced methods almost always carry over, roughly speaking. So, so some of the problems that uh, have this flavor is problems, eigenvector style problems, problems with orthogonality constraints, low rank matrices, PST matrices, and so on. And I'll give you a toy example. Uh, where, uh, I'll just cite here what we did. So we looked at last year to solve that problem. And there's a bunch of previous work. Again, classically, all the work on optimization with the uh, manifold structure was all asymptotic. And our paper kind of starts out uh, non-asymptotic results, which actually, it's not just uh, that people didn't care about it previously, but to write non-asymptotic results for optimization over curved spaces, we had to also develop some new mathematical machinery. But that's a topic for another talk. And but this is just to tell you that this idea of finite sum minimization with stochastic methods holds more generally beyond Euclidean spaces also. I'll give you an example of one of my favorite problems which takes this shape as motivation is textbook example of Gaussian mixture models. So if you're trying to fit a mixture model of capital K number of Gaussians to IID samples, so the likelihood is just this, right? And the numerical challenge of maximizing this problem, so you can take a logarithm and write it as a sum, so it'll start looking like that problem. So the numerical challenge of solving that problem is satisfying the positive definiteness constraint on the covariance matrices. And one way to handle it successfully throughout, which everybody probably here has heard of, is the EM algorithm, which allows you to get very easily to satisfy closed form PSD constraint. You can make the problem an unconstrained, it's already non-convex, you can make it non, you can continue remaining non-convex by replacing the PSD constraint with a Cholesky decomposition, so your constraint becomes LL transpose, now it's unconstrained in L. You can do that, uh, it's not, uh, numerically I don't think it's ever really a good idea, but some people may disagree with me on that. And we thought that okay, this is a PSD constraint, positive definite matrices form some kind of manifold, so you can just try to apply our manifold machinery to solve, uh, maximize this Gaussian likelihood. And it turns out with some care, you can do that and we actually have a full solver available on GitHub, which implements a manifold version of LBFGS with some other uh, fairly careful linear algebra in there. It's a small, smallish d uh, dimension, 35, 200,000 points. So EM kind of runs, does its thing, and this is uh, really using standard, popular, well-established uh, implementations of EM. And if you solve it rather than classical EM, you solve it as an optimization problem, then you actually end up greatly speeding things up. And moreover, it turns out to operate more robustly and reliably, quite interestingly. So to me, the reason I'm showing you this example as an optimization person, I was always annoyed whenever I read claims like, you can't beat EM. I mean, for no optimization method, one can make such a claim. You know, you can always, no, it's, EM is just one of the other optimization methods, so. 
It just happens to have a beautiful format, but uh, you can also beat it. And the nice thing about thinking of it as an optimization problem using this finite sum machinery is things like stochastic, parallel, distributed, etc., all just follow as byproducts once you think in the optimization style. So you can do, develop a theory of stochastic manifold optimization and you see the usual kind of weird pictures that stochastic methods really kick ass. And that's what happens here. And yeah, so it, it actually and this is for larger and larger data set, these effects are more and more pronounced. And it requires a little bit of work to carry over stochastic analysis to manifolds, but one can do it. And so the summary of the stuff so far, and because I think, uh, to where I want to be. So the summary of stuff so far, I just gave you a high level idea of looking at this large scale non-convex optimization problems. Classically, people continue to use SGD. And in, when, if you really want to solve the optimization problem, instead of SGD, you can use methods like Saga or SVRG or other methods which reduce the variance and provably and also empirically converge faster, not necessarily on the generalization error. That's a topic, of course, for another day. And there are some open problems in there which I raised. I'd love to know answers to those open problems. If anybody has any ideas, uh, please catch me. And these ideas go across to manifolds also. So that was summary so far. And I kind of want to gradually now wrap up by showing you some perspectives about the other trends that I didn't talk about. I only have a finite time like all of you. So current trends, the thing that Ben complained about a little bit in the beginning, like if you want to escape, uh, you don't want to be just stationary. You want to kind of have some confidence that you're approximately satisfying set second order criticality. How much more additional effort do you need to basically get out of saddle points? And that's a current popular subtopic where we say, okay, we want to get epsilon stationarity and we want to be, ideally, f for it to be a local minimum, this has to be strictly positive definite. If it's just, in the, if it's just uh, semi-definite, then you're at a stationary point and you need higher order knowledge to judge. But we kind of tolerate this. I still don't understand why we tolerate that, so maybe that's our... Yeah, I think uh, uh, I agree with you. One of the reasons we told it is maybe because it's easy to prove a theorem, but maybe there's a better reason also. That numerically, there's hardly, there's not much more that we can do other than mix this with the idea that if your stationary point is not degenerate, so none of the eigenvalues of the Hessian is truly zero, then a gradient-based method with overwhelming probability is not going <coughs> to remain sitting at a stationary point. So maybe that kind of uh, hand wavy motivation one can use to tolerate this, even though this does not exclude zero eigenvalues. So yeah. So there's a bunch of work on escaping those. So SGD reaches approximate stationarity, doesn't ensure second order criticality. People have used add noise to SGD and as make this assumption about strict saddle point. So I call it assumption on the structure of the Hessian and show that, okay, with some work, you can ensure second order criticality. But then uh, you start your method, the running time starts depending obscenely, also known as exponentially on dimension. And there's other ideas uh, which basically cleverly alternate between first order and second order approaches that, okay, if you really want to do second order stationarity, then better do something second order now and then at least. And uh, ideally, okay, so let's, so ideally what you'd want is to nicely blend a first order approach with a second order approach. So this is the number of iterations. This is just a toy plot, this is not real. That second order method with, uh, do a great job nailing the, optimization, objective function value. First order method just gets stuck at a saddle point. And what you want is to kind of benefit from second order and first order speed that you see here, that ideally you want something that goes as fast as an as low 
or does as good a job as second order, but faster. So this is the uh, desired plot. Okay, This is not what any method is achieving here. It's a kind of made a plot. And so there's a bunch of work on that. I think on uh, tomorrow, probably, uh, Zayan Elensu, he's going to talk about some, some work related, I guess, to uh, doing finite sum plus escaping saddle point, if I'm right. And there's a related, there's a bunch of related work on that. But since I'm out of time, I'm not going to make a long commentary. But it is here listed about various different assumptions on Hessians, on smoothness, and whatnot, for which people are trying to cook up methods which provably escape saddle points. But the most important thing in cooking up these methods that provably escape saddle points is to never really explicitly construct the Hessian. So that's really the thing you're after. <coughs> and somewhere in there, a stochastic Lanzos iteration also pops up because you need a direction of descent. So you need something, some knowledge about the uh, eigenvectors of your Hessian. And the art is, plus with the theory, balancing those things correctly so that you don't need to do too much of the Hessian level stuff <coughs> to retain overall fast convergence. So I don't have time to go into that, so let me skip that. We have some plots on actual data where you can do that on deep autoencoder. So these are actually fairly difficult, uh, deep problems. But one can uh, do a reasonable good job. Anyhow, pardon? Yeah, so I, because we're out of time, so unfortunately, you can see the million other things that uh, I wanted to tell you about but couldn't tell you about. The, there's uh, too many other interesting things in the world of non-convex optimization. But I will close by talking about the things which are of actual immediate theoretical interest that uh, I want to bring to this audience's attention. And I think Ben told me to stop, so I guess I have to stop. Hey, why does it stop? So it says stop. <laughs> it's auto stop. There you go, man. Anyway. Anyway, guys, any questions? Because I am done. <laughs> so clearly, you know, the, my computer says stop. Yeah, yeah that's thanks. Right, that's <laughs> Ask him questions. I'm going to fix this. Uh, what happened? Uh, no, I'm going to fix it. You, you ask some questions? <laughs> Questions? There we go. Take my time. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah. So another way to do variance reduction is by just increasing sample size. Right. So what do you can you say about that theoretically, conceptually? So conceptually, uh, of course, as you make your mini batch larger and larger, you average more and more gradients, so the variance reduces. That is the way. But uh, think of trying to implement that. It's a little hard to. Uh, do that in an implementation. So one could do that. In the end, I think what we're after is how many, so like a fair way to talk about such methods when you compare them, is how many total number of calls to the incremental oracle did you have to make? If you use a mini batch of size billion, then you made billion more calls. So. Uh, However, there's a slight caveat to that. Some people, they talk about mini batches in the context of parallel, so that the cost of extra oracles is reduced. But to really make a theoretically strong statement, uh, I think if you count the full complexity, merely increasing the batch size uh, most likely is not going to do the job. Large scale things. What is large? Like, what is the order of n that you're? Uh, so these ones are uh, uh, large, like academic large, in the sense that they fit in my, uh, they, they fit in a big computer's memory. So it could be just 10 million or something. But uh, one can start taking these things to uh, distributed machines. So their large could easily mean uh, 10 billion. So it, it could mean anything. So it really depends on how big your computer is. Let's, uh, oh, one more Mark question. has a. Uh, 
Uh, can you just briefly comment on how acceleration fits in? That was the slide that I uh, didn't talk about. This the second last slide about the sequence of acceleration methods in non-convex and momentum methods in non-convex and quasi-Newton methods in non-convex. I didn't talk about any of that. It fits in in the same way as uh, for convex that your it improves your dependence on the geometric constants like Lipschitz constants, etc. That I hid in the big O very conveniently. So yeah, I mean, that's, that, that, that is another interesting topic, but yeah. Still possible one more? Yeah. In your analysis, is there any difference between SDRG and Saga in terms of the constant? Any interesting <coughs> remark about the constants that are here? OK, that, that's actually a very nice question. And so for, the, for merely this particular problem that I showed, for the unconstrained problem, there's essentially no difference. But a very weird thing happens that I didn't get a chance to talk about. When we are doing constrained optimization, so you can also apply this Saga, SVRG, et cetera idea to constrained optimization with Frank Wolf. And there, there seems to be a gap between the complexity of Saga versus complexity of SVRG which I don't understand. So they, they, they have some foundational difference. Maybe Mark has some insights on what foundational differences they may have. In this particular case, there was essentially no difference. OK, let's thank Subrit again. And next talk is at